Hi, and welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Andrew O'Hare, Executive Editor of Salon. Uh, joining us today, uh, a guest I'm very excited to, to greet, is the writer and director Paul Greengrass. Uh, Paul, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to have you here. Now, film fans, movie fans, may well know Paul's work the best from the Burn films. Uh, I think you directed three of those, is I that did. right? Yep. Um, so kind of contemporary classics in the action adventure genre, we can say. Mm -hmm. um, your, your new film is not exactly in that vein, although I would say that there are some connections that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. You have a, a Netflix film coming out this week. The title is 22 July, or as Americans might say, July 22nd, but it is in fact 22 July. Um, most people in this country will not recognize anything specific about that date. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what happened on July 22nd? It was the date of uh, the worst political attack in Europe, in Norway, since the war. Uh, a right-wing terrorist called Anders Bering Breivik <clears throat> exploded a bomb in the government quarter that killed a bunch of people and very nearly brought the entire building down. Uh, and then he went to an island about 40 miles from Oslo where there was a, a Labour youth camp going on and he killed about... 70 uh, young adults there and uh, he was a dedicated neo-nazi essentially uh, who believed that he was creating the sort of right-wing 9-11 that was his vision of it and that it would he would raise a standard that others would follow and uh, given the explosive rise of the violent far right in Europe, but also in North America, incubated inside the sort of vast populist movement that's yeah. blowing like a typhoon through all the democracies. He's maybe not not uh, wrong in that. I was I was going to say this this film, which is it's, it's it is very disturbing to watch, but I, I want to tell people, and I, I hope you agree with this that. First of all, I think you, although you certainly show some of the violence, you, 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 do, you attempt not to dwell on it. I hope not. I don't believe so. I mean, the most important thing I would say about the film, and it was something I was clear about myself, it's not a film about the attacks. Of course, the first half hour or so is, is about the attacks because you have to understand what happened and, to a certain extent, as an audience, live through that. Which is terrifying, all, yeah, it, truly it, terrifying. It, 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 it's disturbing, but I do believe it's handled with great restraint and, and, uh, and you know, we've obviously made this film with the families of those affected and one of the things that was most gratifying to me when we took this film to show them, you know, a month or so ago, was that that was something that they, they said, that the, they, they they approved and supported the way the, 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 the attacks were handled with, with sensitivity and restraint. But, but it is a disturbing sequence. There's no two ways about it. Um, in order to get to what the film's about, which is Norway's struggle for her democracy in the aftermath of this attack, and in a sense that's a story about Norway then and the characters in the film then and those people, but it's ultimately, I think, a, I hope, a metaphor for what's going on in all the democracies of the West. You know, there is this huge unprecedented move to the right and how we, what that feels like, where it's going, what the dangers are inherent in that, what's incubated inside that and how we may f may be able to f fight back against that uh, is the subject of the film, and I, I I think and I believe it's an inspiring story. I, I think it is also. I think it's very, it's very provocative in, in those terms. And mm -hmm. I, I was I was dr dreading the opening sequence. I'll be frank with mm -hmm. you about that. Mm -hmm. I'm I, I am the, the father of two teenagers. A large me, number of people too. in the world are are parents. Cool. Me too. Who are going to come to this with? that sense of dread and apprehension. Every parent's worst fear mm -hmm. is that, you know, whether it's rational or not, that the world will inflict something, inflict something terrible on our children, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure you feel that way too. Like, For sure, that's uh, why I made the film. Any of us would stand in front of a bullet rather than have, have our children mm -hmm. be hit. And the parents of these kids on that island, Norway, didn't have that chance. Correct. Um, 
but I did feel like you, you provide a, a way emotionally and dramatically to go forward from that terrible event. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, that's a very important aspect of, the, of this film. And, and part of that journey, or, 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 or maybe better, the heart of that journey is how those young people themselves, young adults, you yes. know, 17, 18, 19, 20, um, how they moved forward from that. Uh, because the question really for them, and obviously there's one particular young man is the heart of the film. Yeah. How, if you're a civic-minded young adult, as these young people were, how do you move forward after being attacked from the right in that way? What, what does it do to you? Obviously on a personal level, but what does it do to your ideals, your sense of, of where society is going? And that really is the drama of the piece and, and how those young people <clears throat> elected to confront him in court uh, with courage and with uh, dignity, but with an overwhelming purpose to defeat him and his worldview, defeat him emotionally, defeat him morally, defeat him intellectually, in every way, that's the story of this film. And I think you, know, you can look and see something of that occurring. I think if you look at the response to Parkland in your country, yeah. I think you see something of that. Young people starting to engage, to decide for themselves what kind of a world, what kind of a democracy they want. You can see uh, something like that in, in my country, in the UK, you mm -hmm. know, that it was a grave shock to my young adult children to wake up one day and find that they were no longer European. And uh, I can imagine. A, and all the polls show and showed that young people were the most pro, by overwhelming yeah. numbers, pro-European. Mm -hmm. But sadly, the same polls showed that it was young people who were least likely to vote right. in the referendum. Right. That's changed. Uh, you can see the same thing in Germany, where mm -hmm. you have this explosive growth of the uh, party, the AfD, Alternative for Deutschland. Um, and in particular, the most dynamic. That's the right-wing anti-immigrant party. In Definitely, Germany. yeah. And and and, and um, much the most dynamic part of a dynamically growing party is the AfD youth wing, mm -hmm. which is really hugely, hugely popular and growing every day, literally every day. But young people are realizing that they have to engage if these ideas are to be defeated, and I think that that. And I, I speak just as a parent, you know, that's why I made the film and mm -hmm. I'm a filmmaker, that's what I do. And you try and find a way of, a lens to look at the world that, that speaks to you. But I think that the next generation is going to be about young people having to make a choice. You know, young people in large numbers are being drawn to alternatives. Yeah. Some of which lie in the, within democratic norms, but towards the right hand edge but some of which for sure lie well outside. And this narrative, <clears throat> which at its heart is about rage and betrayal, uh, that speaks about elites, right, and the sham of democracy. I mean, these were Brevik's words, by the way. These, these arguments that he articulated and we show in the film that, that he used in his trial, and were on the margins in 2012, now are in the mainstream. Yes. There is no uh, populist politician, either here or in, in Europe, who would have a problem speaking Brevik's words. Now, I want to be clear about this. They, they of course, would not endorse his actions. Right. But the troubling thing is that the world view, the argument, this, this narrative of betrayal and rage, is driving everything before it in, in our democracies. And, and that is very, very troubling, as I say, because we're not, we're not talking about 
the great traditions of conservatism and liberalism. Absolutely that, not. You know, I agree in other words, here you have yeah. Democrats and Republicans, and they. We they, used to anyway, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you, you, know, you still do. Yeah. And, and we have Conservative Party and the Labour Party in the yeah. UK. And every country, every democracy has some version of that. And, and those traditions argue with each other and compete with each other. And people can sit in the centre ground of those parties or towards either wing. But each sits within a democratic norm. And that's a, a part of the creativity of democracy, and and it's what drives us forward. You know, out of those contentious arguments, yeah. progress comes. That's not what we're looking at at the moment. We're looking at, and this is me talking, but I, I, it seems to me anyway, <laughs> that we're looking at this huge populist revolt that's a like a typhoon through all the democracies. And as I say. All of it is based on a rage that's out there. It's yeah. not coming from nowhere. People feel locked out of, of course, uh, out of the rewards of a globalizing world, and they feel resentful at inequality, and they feel deeply resentful about, uh, you know, population movements that, that they think are being forced upon them and that cause them to feel a loss of identity. And, 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 uh, and of course, the fear of all of that, which is not the same as the actuality. All of that creates this populist upsurge. But the problem is that it, it, it tears up democratic norms. And as I say, some of it sits within democratic parameters, yeah. towards the margins, but within. But an increasingly large amount of it now sits outside. It, the proposition of a lot of that thought is revolutionary. It's, sure. it's and and yeah. and if young people uh, start, and I'll shut up. But if young no, people start to, with a backdrop of economic crisis, with a backdrop of technology driving profound change and mm -hmm. job insecurity, uh, you know, with a backdrop of unprecedented population movements, which are a reality in a globalizing world. If young people start to give up on democratic norms, we'll be in a world of, of, of pain, yeah. as, as our parents and grandparents found in the 30s. So that's why I made the film. Well, and it, it's worth noting, to, to go back to the specific incident mm. here, that Anders Breivik didn't pick that particular location at random. It was, uh, it was easy to, to stage a massacre there because it was an island, but it also was an island camp for essentially Norway's social democratic or uh, center left party Correct. youth activists. So it was yep. precisely the kind of the model of democracy that he didn't like, which Correct. included multiculturalism. That was a party Correct. that was eager to welcome immigrants to Norway. And the kids were actually multiracial on, on this island. So it was a very specific mm -hmm. and symbolic target. And many of them would, would would become leaders of their community in different right. parts of Norway or, or, or play leadership roles or contend for leadership roles, for sure. Yeah. He called it a political camp. Afterwards, he said, I liquidated yeah. a political camp. Yeah, that's a very, very chilling language. Mm. In terms of the timing... Don't we remember that from, yeah. from a different era. From a different era, yeah. In terms of the timing, did you take on this project? When, when we think about the last few years and everything from Brexit, mm -hmm the election mm -hmm. of Donald Trump in the mm -hmm. United States, the uh, Charlottesville, Virginia incident, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you know about. Oh, yeah. um, at, at what point in that history did you decide to take on this project? What was motivating you at that moment? Around about the beginning of it. Yeah. And um, I must say I found it disturbing, troubling that, that, that as we've made this film, so the world seems to have slid further into this difficulty. I mean, well, where do we start? You know, Sweden, three, four weeks ago, That's elected right. a, a party with, you know, with strong neo-Nazi roots to hold the balance of power. Um, this in, this, in lovely week social in, this week in Brazil, right? Of course, yeah. this week in Brazil. So, so this is a big, big problem, and part of the f the film at heart is about how Norway fought back. What 
what did that feel like? On what basis? Who, who and how? And, and that I found to be hugely inspiring. And, and I think also instructive for us all today, you know, because it does come down to young people. You know, we tell the story of this young man, Vilja Hansen, who's a remarkable young man, but he stands for all those young people who survived the attacks. Um, yeah, I felt like you were almost using him as a um, symbolic representation of, of Norwegian society. That may be too much of a critical yeah, interpretation, I, I, I but a little bit. Yeah, or, or democracy itself. Democracy, You know, yeah. when he's gravely wounded, as he was, yeah. and could have died, you know, and he's lying there in the operating theatre. That's what I thought of, you know, that I think that we're... Our democracies are not in great shape. Now, you can argue, of course, <laughs> if, you're, if, you, yeah. if you're, you know, of the populist right, that, that part of the problem, and, and I understand this, by the way, I understand, I don't agree with Steve Bannon, but I understand what he means when he, when he talks about the, the way the centre doesn't respond and somewhere, yeah. you know, there's an, an institutional unwillingness to respond. And... I, I, I think that's part of the problem I can agree with. I mean, I don't agree with a a anything, and I certainly deplore the ways going around Europe yep. trying to link together far right, uh, hard right, and in some cases neo Nazi parties into a sort of uh, axis, is the only word I can <laughs> call it. I mean, that, that yeah. is literally yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, now, The centre of politics, whether of the right or the left, this is not about right and left, the centre of politics, the, 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 the core of a, what, what you can call perhaps a liberal democracy, not, not with a capital L, but you know, descriptively, has got to respond. Something's trying to be yeah. born, some new consensus that lies beyond, uh, I, I would, th I think, something that lies beyond what we've had for the last 20 or 30 years, which has been fundamentally an acceptance of uh, globalization as a, 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 a development that provides us all with growth and opportunity, which it does. But the problem is... Extremely it, unevenly distributed. Extremely right? unevenly distributed yeah. and, and creating, driving uh, things that that are antithetical to liberal democracy. I mean, right. uh, you know, we, we, we all, 30 years ago, we all saw te emerging technologies as the friend of democracy. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think now we can not see so that much. that is yeah. not so much. Now, yeah. it's not that they can't be, but not so much. So what do we do about that challenge? How do we harness the power to the good and mitigate the echo chamber that's creating political instability? Same in an economic sense. How do we harness the good of globalization uh, but not have this tremendous resentment of people feeling that they're locked out? How do we deal with the profound issue of population movements, which are unprecedented? You yes. know, it's pointless to pretend. Pointless to pretend that, 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 it's, that, not that, that it's not happening. And that it's not happening. And disruptive in some ways. Yes, yes, and that people aren't. Uh, 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 Disturbed by it, afraid of it, resent it, yes. weren't asked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's a. These are the problems that 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 the centre ground, where the right and left of politics have got to respond to, and and the the success of this right wing typhoon is at the very least an expression of the failure of the centre. I, I think. Yeah, and I think what Steve Bannon would say. And which he's partly right about is that 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 sort of s mainstream center right to center left uh, area of politics has been unable to find a coherent response Definitely. so far, um, which is partly why we see on the other side of the coin, you know, Bernie Sanders in the United States, Jeremy Corbyn in the Correct. UK, these uh, populist left movements, if you Correct. want to call them that, yeah. or social democratic mm -hmm. movements. Mm -hmm. um, as, as you know, you're aware more than I am, the main the, the leadership of the Labour Party thought that Jeremy Corbyn was a joke. Right. Yes. And and they they were horrified to discover that most people who identified with the Labour Party actually wanted somebody like that uh, to lead. Yeah. It. I mean, look, I, I'm not a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn. Fair but enough. I think, and you know, I've spent my lifetime 
uh, or most of my lifetime inside the Labour Party and been part of its debates. But I think it's the same problem. It's it's yeah. the 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 the. I mean, he has some powerful arguments, Jeremy Corbyn. There's no question about that. And and part of what I like about uh, him that he's, he's trying. There's no doubt he's trying to generate ideas, new ideas about right. how to respond to this in a way I think that the Conservative Party in Britain is failing to. But but that sort of immaterial. The, for me, the issue, and I think it perhaps is in this program, is that whatever it is that's going to be born, whatever the new thinking in, in conventional politics, let's call it that, whether of the conventional right or the conventional left, is going to come from younger people. There's a generational problem. I mean, I agree you with know, that completely. I, 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 and you, you and I are on the wrong side of the generational problem. Yes, I'm and, yes. and if you look at, uh, let's look at the, the sort of liberal side of politics. Okay, your last candidate was Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Our next candidate in the Labour Party is Jeremy Corbyn. So they would sit on that spectrum of, of, of liberalism between very centrist in Hillary Clinton's case and, and much more like Bernie Sanders, you know, Jeremy yeah. Corbyn. But the truth is, they're both marked by being elderly. They're both marked by the 1960s, basically. They were and both so shaped exactly, by the 1960s. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And to me, the interesting thing, and that's why I ended the film as I did, um, I, uh, uh, this young man ultimately is intent on going into politics. That whatever happened mm -hmm. to him, this uh, savage attack and shot five times, and really he should have died in those first couple of days after that. But he is determined to get in there and make his mark. And, and somewhere, something is struggling to be born, you know, um, a bit like the WB8. I was poem. going to say, yes, and, very and adroit. Is yeah. that is that a strange beast that's slouching towards <laughs> Bethlehem right. in the dark sense? Possible. It's definitely possible. Or, or will the kinds of leadership that Parkland threw up, yeah. uh, will this populist tide be confronted by some new engagement by young people? who will recognize that unfettered globalization has to be controlled. It's like industrialization. You know, industrialization right. threw up all this enormous wealth, yes. you know, in your country and in mine, you know. And the great struggle after it was to ensure that the rewards were harnessed so that children didn't have to work in factories, you know, uh, that factories could be uh, civilized rather than places that, that Chained humanity. Sure, sure. Cha you know, chapter three of Karl Marx's Capital on the length of the working day. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or, and could the rewards be be shared fairly? And that led to the creation of welfare state. So somewhere out of the immense protean forces of globalization will come a political settlement. And young people are going to be part of it. But it's not, I think, going to come admirable in their different ways, though Hillary Clinton and Jeremy Corbyn are, or Bernie right. Sanders. You know, they, they're not people it's, without qualities if you're on the liberal wing of politics. But equally, neither is John McCain or, or, yeah. or other conservative thinkers. But there's something generationally going on here. Yes. And, and it's not clear, I think, to any of us when that generation is going to form itself into political leadership. But you see signs of it. Your, your senator, the Senate run in Texas maybe, yes. tells us something. That O'Rourke, yes, mm. yes. So absolutely fascinating conversation. Paul Greenbrest, thank you so much. Let me say really quickly, 22 July is available on Netflix October 10th, which is tomorrow as I say this, but it might not be tomorrow when you're watching this. And uh, also opens in some theaters, I believe, yes, a couple hundred, couple hundred theaters across uh, North America, and um, Europe, and Europe, and Europe. Paul Greengrass, twenty-two July. Thank you so much. Thank you.